go. Well, I want to ask a question before we get started, before we read the passage. Have we ever been disappointed in someone in our life? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I'm sure we have been a disappointment to people as well in our life. You know, we, we make a promise, and we don't keep it. And sometimes we know what we're doing, and sometimes we, it's, I forgot. And, and there's many times that we just have not been faithful to our promises. Um, and we, our memories are, aren't on as much as they used to be. I know that for sure, especially with mine. And <laughs> but I also know that there's other areas of life where we struggle with, where maybe we know people that haven't been faithful in all aspects of their life, and we get disappointed in them, and we have a hard time trusting or putting our faith back into that person again. And we've probably all experienced that. And that sometimes jades are way of viewing life, and we really don't trust anyone hardly anymore. In fact, I remember a phrase that a president used to say, trust, but verify. So, and, and that goes to show we really don't completely put our trust in, in, in things around us. But when it comes to God, sometimes we do the same because we think, well, life is not perfect. No one's perfect. And we can't expect anything to go perfect. God can't be perfect. He's got to fail. He's got to trip up every now and then. And that's the way some people think, and that's the way sometimes I think we think in default in our own minds sometimes when we think about God. And uh, maybe it's hard for us to even think that when Jesus walked in this life that he was perfect. It kind of is hard to fathom someone living a perfect life or someone just being perfect. And the audience of this book, the Hebrew people that this author was writing to, maybe that was part of their thinking as well. And, and they seen church members fall to the wayside and go back to their old way of thinking, back to Judaism, back to the Old Testament. And they say, well, they both have their failings, don't they? And I might as well just go back to this old way of thinking. It's familiar to me, and I won't get persecuted if I go back to believing this way. And so they probably just thought, well, one is good as the other. And that's probably the way they thought. And they said, why not? And they probably thought it was just an across-the-board swap. Let's go back, and we won't be persecuted over there. But those the Christians, they get persecuted for what they believe in. So why should we be with them? Well, the author of the book of Hebrews wants us to stop and to behold and to contemplate. And I'm going to jump to verse well, the, the second part of verse 2, where he says, Consider Jesus, and I want us to think about what he, the author is telling us there. And other words that we can put in there is take note or contemplate instead of consider. But the one that really jumped out to me was the word behold. And when I was doing this, and I was looking at all these different words that it was in the Greek, and the one that really jumped out at me was, Behold, Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. And the thing that came to my mind was, let's say you're at the fair, or you're, and, you, and you walk by these things, and you're, you're eating your snack, your, can, your cotton candy, your ice cream cone, and you're walking, and you hear someone shout out, Behold the most powerful man in the world, or behold the bearded lady, or the sword swallower, and all this stuff back in. And so they want to catch your attention and draw you in and bring you in to watch what's taking place. So I have this picture in mind that the author is trying to get 
our attention and to bring us to watch and to listen what is going to be taking place. So it's beholding God, beholding Christ. And he's saying, behold, I am here. Have you looked at our Savior? And that is, I think, the message that he's trying to do. He's trying to get our attention and to capture our attention so that we listen to what he has to say. So the title of my message is, Do We Behold a Faithful Savior? And he starts out in um, the very first verse, and he starts out and he says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling. Last week, we covered part of this already. And he go takes us back to this. And the first thing, he, there's three things that he brings out about us before he gets into talking about Christ. And he says, therefore, holy brethren. And remember last week in Hebrews chapter 2, where it, it, it says uh, in verse 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. We are holy. We are sanctified. And that, again, is all past tense. We have been and in fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, that whole past tense comes to play again when he says, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, he says, Even when you were dead in your transgressions, we were been made alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us in the with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And again, this is all past tense stuff. We have been sanctified. We have been glorified. We have been called. This is done. And what the author is trying to tell us here, especially from back in Hebrews chapter 2, it's a done deal. It's as if we are seated in the heavenlies right now. It's a, it's, it's a sealed fate for us, and it's a good fate. We are in heaven. It's as good as gold that we are in heaven. And then he says, brethren, holy brethren. We talked about that a little bit last week as well. Where it says, he is, same chapter and same verse, Hebrews chapter 2. He is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. And again, that's an amazing thing. God is not disappointed in us. He is proud to call us his brothers and sisters. And when he says, I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. I, I get excited every time I read that verse just because it, it is amazing to think that Jesus is proclaiming my name and he is proud of me. He's not ashamed of me. And why is that? Because he has sanctified me. He has made me holy. He has made me brethren. And then he calls us partakers of a heavenly calling. And I want to take us back to, to 2 Peter, because remember, we looked at 2 Peter just a little bit ago. And Peter talks about that very same thing, about partakers of a heavenly calling. 2 Peter Chapter 1, verse 4. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. But I want us to think of what he says right there. It is it's granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. He has promised, and he is faithful. He is a faithful Savior. He has promised. He keeps his promises. In Genesis, he promised that he would send a Redeemer. He fulfilled that at the cross. He keeps his promises. He says he will come back again for us. He will keep his promises. And then he says, 
Behold Jesus, or consider Jesus the apostle and the high priest of our confession. <coughs> he is our great apostle. He's not just like one of the disciples. He's the great apostle. He's the great ambassador from heaven. He is the great envoy or the messenger from heaven. And remember, what are angels? They are ambassadors as well. And remember, he is greater than the angels. And here we're going to learn that he is greater than Moses and how he is. But he is also our high priest. And in short, what does a high priest do? He pleads to God on our behalf. He pleads to God. And what, is, what does Christ do? He is at the right hand of our Heavenly Father, intercessing for us day and night. And then he makes sacrifice for the people. Well, Jesus was the sacrifice. He wasn't just high priest. He was the sacrifice as well. And he prays for his brothers and sisters. And then... He's not just that, but our second point, he was faith, faithful to the Father. He says he was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses was in all his house. <clears throat> and, he's, and one of the things I wanted to bring out here is in Hebrews chapter 2 or in the previous passage when we were looking at it, it says, therefore he, that be Jesus, had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and what? A faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. He is our faithful high priest. <clears throat> and, and he was as, what does he say? As to, he was faithful to him who appointed him. And that, who was that? That would have been God the Father. And he points that out, and John points this out as well, that he was, that he was appointed by the Father. John chapter 6, verse 38 through 40, and he says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He was appointed, and it was the will of the Father that Jesus come and lay down his life for us. And he says, for this is the will of him who sent me. And this is the part that is beautiful. That all of that he has given me, I will lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. He's talking about us. He will raise us up. He won't lose us. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. I love that. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. He was faithful to the Father. He was also, he is worthy of great glory. And we, what do we mean by he is worthy of great glory? Well, Moses was worthy of glory as well. Moses, when he was the leader of the people of Israel, he was worthy of glory. He did great things for the people of Moses. In fact, when he came down off the mountain after receiving the Ten Commandments, what does the Bible say? His face shone bright. And he, people beheld him as, whoa, this is an amazing thing. And the people of Israel even up until the time of Christ, and even now, they hold Moses in high regard. But he says, For he had been counted of worthy of more glory than Moses, by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. One of the things that happened with Moses, he was, he was faithful to the people, very faithful. And in fact, we can look in the book of Exodus and we can see a story that happened there. If we look in Exodus Chapter 32, I didn't, was able to write that down, but if you 
want to uh, write that down. Exodus chapter 32, and in verse 9, this is the story of the golden calf when he wasn't coming down off the mountain. They got tired of waiting for him, and they said, let's make our own God. So they made this golden calf, and when they did, God got angry. And Moses broke the Ten Commandment tablets, and this is, he says, The Lord said to Moses in verse 9, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me be alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. Now that's a great temptation for Moses, and he may be going, wow, you know, I get to get rid of all these people right here, and I can just start fresh. Who wouldn't want a fresh start? And that's what God was offering to Moses. Moses stood in the gap. And that's what it says. Done. Then Moses entreated the Lord, his God, and said, O oh Lord, why does your anger burn against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, With evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Yeah, Moses made a good point. He says, the Egyptians are going to laugh. They say, your God took you out of Egypt with all these miracles, and now he turns around and just wipes you all out. You know, and, and that is not how God <coughs> operates. And in, in a lot of ways, I think this was a test for Moses in a lot of ways, so that Moses would stand in that gap, and in that way, he is a picture of who Christ is. Because what did Christ do? He stood in the gap as a faithful savior for us. But he does go back here and he says, For he has been counted of more glory than Moses by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. And an illustration that I think is a good example here is, Let's say you're at work and you have your foreman or your manager come to you and he tells you to do different things. But then the owner comes in and says, I'm going to replace the foreman and I'm going to be here. The owner comes in of the, of the whole operation. He then comes in and says, this is how we're going to run things. This is the difference between the owner and the manager. You know, you don't know if the, if the manager has everything lined up right and everything is going to be working out correctly. But in this case, the owner, the manager, he's a human. He has faults. And he's mortal. He's going to die one day. The owner, the builder of the house here in this situation, he's perfect. He's the creator. He's the one who made us. And he isn't going to die. Because he already did. And he rose again for us. <clears throat> and that is to me one of the most beautiful things to understand that as new covenant Christians, we don't have Moses, we have Jesus, the creator, the, the, our savior, that faithful savior. And, and that is just such an important thing for us to understand there. Um. And he says this in, in, in Hebrews chapter 2, actually chapter 1, we need to understand that this person that now is in charge of us instead of the old covenant, he is immortal. And he not only is immortal, he created the world. Remember back when we read in Hebrews chapter 1, in these last days he has spoken to us by his spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he, through whom also he made the world. And that lines right up with what he says here in verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. In verse 10 of chapter 1. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. 
that is an amazing thing to think that we have the creator of this world with us. We talk with him. We pray with him. It, to me, as and, and we are his brethren. And that, to me, is just, this is who we are. We are brothers and sisters to Christ himself. And he is the creator. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, it says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is the very same person that stands up and says, I am proud of you. I am not ashamed of you. And he calls us brothers and sisters, the creator, our savior. He made us, he saved us, and he calls us his brothers and sisters. We are in a place of privilege and honor as his children. And I'm just amazed when I read this and understand that. Then he is also faithful as a son. Verse 6, but Christ was faithful as a son over his house. Whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm to the end. He is faithful as a son. In John chapter 3, verse 35 and 36, it says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not <laughs> obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. He is faithful to us as a son over the house. And... It isn't like, remember, um, Moses was a servant in the house. He was part of the house. And he was there, and he, he was a faithful servant. Again, he was a faithful steward. But the author of Hebrews says that Jesus was a faithful son over the house. Jesus, he came to earth and he dwelt among us, but now he is over us. He is... He, is exists outside of the house for us. And that is what he is telling us. In, in 1 Peter chapter 2, because that is one of the, the passages that we would go back to because we've been familiar with the book of Peter. First and second Peter. First Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, it says about us who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you have not seen him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. The last part of that verse is really neat because he says, over his house, and he says, of whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence and boast of our hope firm to the end. The Hebrew people were going under great tribulation and trial. And again, they wanted to just say, well, maybe we can just slip back in over to the synagogue and we can start worshiping, you know, that we, we did before as if there was no Christ that hadn't come. And the author of Hebrews says, he has come. He is here and he's greater. And he says, hold fast to that. Even though you deal with persecution, because when you come out of that, as Peter says, 
The proof of your faith being more precious than gold, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is an amazing thing for us to think about when we understand that we will be receiving rewards when we get to heaven. But I just want to look quickly back over this as we behold Jesus, our faithful Savior. He is our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to his Father. He was faithful to the Father. He is worthy of great glory. And he was faithful as a son over the house, over us. And one day he's going to keep that promise and he will return for us. And then we are, and it's only because of his faithfulness that we are able to be holy brethren and partakers of a heavenly calling as he talks about us in that first verse. It is because of his faithfulness that we are holy. It is because of his faithfulness that we are his brother. It is because of his faithfulness that we are partakers in a heavenly calling. I want to close with a passage from 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And it is in verses 11 through 13. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. God can't deny himself. Even if we lose faith, he will remain faithful to us. He will remain faithful. Uh, to me, I just can't get over that almost in a lot of ways. If we are faithless, he remains faithful to us. And because of that, we are what? We are holy brothers and sisters, partakers of a heavenly calling. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we rejoice that you are a faithful Savior, worthy of great glory, that you were faithful to the Father, you were faithful as a son over us. Lord, we are so glad, we are so wonderfully glad that you have become <clears throat> our faithful Savior, that perfect person that has never broke a promise. Lord, we thank you that you have fulfilled the promises that you have so far, and we know you are trustworthy, and it is a trustworthy statement that if we are faithful, you will remain faithful to us. You cannot deny yourself. In these things we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's rejoice and sing one more song. Thank you.